put like uh, mountain tires on it or something. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, basically, you guys, today I just want to walk through these notes a bit. There's some really simple practice that you guys will get very quickly. Thanks for having your your um, uh, your data booklets out. It's just you, you have to reference the periodic table. It's a bunch of stuff you do not need to memorize. Okay. Yeah, part of the part of the skill of being able to master this course is being aware of what, all the resources you have at your disposal because it is kind of broad and I, I'll try to minimize that as much as possible. So anyway, we ended on uh, the Lewis dot diagrams yesterday. Um, this is really the foundation for why atoms make bonds with other atoms. Okay, this is the whole justification for it. So if you make sense of where the electrons are, it'll help you just do it pretty quick. Okay. Um, lithium, sodium, they're actually in the same group in the periodic table, if you happen to look at that, okay? Right. Lithium and sodium are right here because they both have one electron. Actually, in group two, that means, yeah, it means they, um, they lose two electrons, these guys lose three. Then you get into these transition elements and the pattern kind of breaks apart a little bit, but not really. Um, but definitely over here, fluorine and chlorine, they are in group 17. So they are one electron away from being a noble gas, kind of, I guess, okay? At least in terms of their orbitals. So these guys are just missing one. These guys are missing seven, okay? Like they could, there's, they only have one valence electron to fill that outer orbital. And then yes, neon and argon, you guys are seeing that right away. Um, the name of the game is stability. All the elements want to be stable, and they will do it in like three ways. We're gonna we're gonna emphasize that today. Any element can become more stable if they pick up electrons, or if they lose electrons, or if they share electrons. Okay, so uh, that's actually oh I summarized it already, but it's right there. Okay, so underneath that. Um, everybody wants to be stable like the noble gases. I kind of want to emphasize that a bit because you can easily get questions where you have to explain why, uh, why compounds or why um, materials are doing the things they're doing. It's because they want to be stable. Okay, Everybody wants to be stable like a noble gas. So just some vocabulary you guys might remember. If you gain electrons, you're going to be negative, and we call that an anion, okay? So an ion is really any, any charged um, atom. So an anion is negative, a cation is positive, okay? I haven't thought of a way to memorize that, but I always get, I don't like cats, so I always think of them as negative, so that messes me up. But anyway. hey. <laughs> so, um, sorry to all the people who like cats. Um, so those are the those are the two. We're going to look at the the methodologies for gaining and losing electrons. If you share electrons, though, that forms what's called a covalent bond, and that shouldn't surprise you too much because basically we're saying it's cooperation um, in of valence electrons. Okay, so. In my mind, that, that's what I think of when I think of covalent, okay? So it's the valence electrons are cooperating, they're working together. And you'll see that real fast. That's probably going to be pretty obvious. So, quick review. Here's losing. No, it's not losing. This is gaining. Ah. So chlorine has the seven. And I know yours is in black and white. If you want to circle one, that's fine. I was going to try and color one. Because, I mean, if we compare these two, what I just highlighted right there in red... That is an electron that was picked up, or that is, uh, yeah, that was picked up from some process, okay? So there's a free electron floating around. The chlorine's like, woohoo, I'll take it. So now you get a chlorine atom that is negative. So I'm putting it in square brackets just to define, okay? Not too surprising. Hey, I pick up an extra electron. I, uh, and that's what these numbers are over here. Um, oh, P, E, and N. What do you think those stand for? Proton? What does the E stand for? Electron, neutron. neutron, neutron. There you go. Okay, so you guys are sharp. So if I if you abbreviate all that, that's why the chlorine atom is now negatively charged because it has 17 positives and 18 negatives. So you have a net of plus. Well, I got to be careful saying that. It's a net of minus one. Okay. 
whatever. That, that's not too surprising. I mean, the, the, the formula here is showing you that the, the chlorine all by itself, you add an electron, bang. Okay? So that's what all this text is just um, summarizing. Um, and what you should remember, this is from, this is just from like Science 9, if you guys remember. What do you, you guys remember, uh, maybe we should just write it down here. You guys remember what the law of charges is? And when I say charges, I'm talking about positive and negative charges. How do they act? If you have positive and negative charges, what's the rule that explains what they do? Positives and negatives do this. Okay, Yes, and what's and the other one? The negatives and positives and together they bond. So, un like yes. So, the rules are unlike charges, so if they're positive and negative, that's what Lucille was saying, they attract. And that's just the vocabulary we use. I'm confident you guys remember that for the most part. But I'm gonna, we're going to reference that. It'd be really obvious when we're building molecules. So yeah, if you've got a positive molecule and there's a negative one right beside it, they're going to attract each other. They're going to be pulled towards each other by electric forces. There's a literal attractive force that will do that. The opposite happens if they're the same. Okay, so um, sometimes I guess we just say like charges or similar charges, but let's just keep it simple because I think that's how we, I think that's how you learned it. You say like charges repel. Okay, is the vocabulary there? They, like, they push apart, they hate each other. Okay, so we'll see that a bit later in some of the other stuff we're doing, right? Oh, you guys are just upgrading your seats. Yeah, I mean, I still got the same board. I got to. <laughs> Do you not erase that yet? Sorry? Do you not erase that? Oh, yeah, I will. I'll leave it right there. Yeah, okay. So, anyway, the point is uh, in chemistry, it's very easy to make ions. And these elements just do it on their own if they're able to. They'll just like, because they want to. They want to be like the noble gases. Okay, the, the far right, whatever that is, group 18 or whatever. Yeah, helium, neon, argon, krypton. Yeah, krypton. That's cool. Yeah, uh, uh, now. Oh, yeah, you're fine. So, oops, repel. So, the next page shows losing of the top. Sodium will do this. Oh, because, um, oh yeah, it's, it's written right here. You can even just highlight it. They don't have to write it or anything. Um, uh, it's easier, it's easier for the sodium atom to lose one electron than to gain seven, okay? Like if, if sodium wants to become like a noble gas, you could give it seven extra electrons and it'd be like, okay, awesome, my, my orbital's full, but that's way harder it's a lot easier just to lose that electron. Like you can just, in one kind of one motion or one event, you just lose the electron, done. So, and, the, and it's no surprising that in nature, nature tends to take the easiest route or the most efficient route. That's what tends to happen. And it's, that's what's happening here. So yeah, the sodium atom loses its electron. So the formula shows you go from the sodium atom to the sodium ion. And oh, you know, we should maybe say that. Technically, this is a, oops. Technically, this is a cation. Sorry, let me fix that. Okay. This is a cation because the cations are positive. I guess I could have labeled this one up here. This is an anion. But as long, if I'm more, if you remember they're positive or negative, that's uh, that's a lot more important in my mind because you have to know what they do in certain circumstances. So yeah, boom. Then we have sodium with plus one. Surprise. Okay, the, the third way to be stable, okay, there's three ways that uh, or, uh, atoms become stable. It's by sharing electrons. Uh, a lot of atoms, or sorry, a lot of the non-metals do this, okay? If you have two chlorine <coughs> atoms, they both have seven, but they'd like to have eight. So they can do that by cheating a little bit. Now again, yours is not in color, but you can add it if you want. Um, these electrons, the ones I'm just circling, they belong to the chlorine on the right. Okay, and the others belong to the chlorine on the left. So, what I did circle right there, that is a, um, yeah, that is a co covalent bond. I guess it's already labeled. Don't really label it. Not. That's a covalent bond. So yeah, they're sharing electrons. 
We call these, we call this molecule or these in this structure, we call it a diatomic molecule. Now there's a whole bunch of, of prefixes, but you guys probably recognize di. Di just means two. Okay? So diatomic. And if you wrote this um, in a formula, it would be Cl2. Cl2. Okay. Um, oh, I bet you guys can give me, can you guys give me some gases primarily? They're often gases. Can you give me some gases that are written as the symbol and there's two of them? Can you think of another one? What is it? Oh, no, no, helium is a noble gas. But hydrogen, hydrogen is not a noble gas. If you have hydrogen gas, you write that as H2. And actually, and there's usually a subscript. I could put the subscript here too. Oxide. Solid liquid gas, we're going to go with that. Sorry? Okay, well, it, we don't say oxide if it's a diatomic molecule. We just say oxygen, but it's O2. You write it as O2 for the same reason. Chloride, same thing. Yep. Or it'd be F2, iodine is I2, and so on. So on. Okay. Oh, phosphorus, yes. Um, I think it's four, and then sulfur can be like eight. Okay, so you guys remember all those. Okay, awesome. I was like, oh, yeah, those are some good ones. <laughs> but hey, it's just trying to be stable. Okay, so if you get enough, uh, they all have their valence electrons, and they can be stable if they share electrons. So this leads us really quickly into um, bonding, which is the next section. So how do we make um, how do you make bonds or connections between uh, atoms? This is a bond already, so that's one of them. If you share electrons, you're going to bond. But the other ways involve. Um, uh, basically donating or receiving electrons, okay? So let's just quickly cover this. I mean, this is more review of it, if not uh, a summary of metals versus non-metals. Um, if you look at the periodic table, this will help you as well if you have a question on it. Um, uh, oh yeah, where are the metals on this? <laughs> where would I find them? Everywhere. Stop you're like, you're pointing this way. So metals are all over here. Yeah, it's basically the whole left side. This is the staircase. It, I think yours is bolded, right? They did that on purpose. The staircase is what separates the two. The other way you can tell is if you start looking at all the metals, what is the charge on most of them? Because it shows you what they what they form when they form a charge. Is it positive or negative? It's pot. You can see it's all over the place, right? Like, yeah. Uh, oh my goodness. Yeah, nickel's positive. Copper is like two plus, and then one plus. Zinc is two plus. Blah. So look, you see where when you get to the bridge, or when you get to the staircase, I should say, that's sort of the crossover point, and then everything's negative. So that's one way to make a quick distinction. Hey, the metals, they make positive ions. You can see it all over the periodic table. The staircase, oh yeah, do you guys remember? What, what, what do we call the elements that are on the staircase? They have a special name. Ooh, close. That, that's these guys. Alkaline metals over here. What is it? Yes, that's the word. That's the word. Okay. So you, I mean, I don't care if you mention that. But, um, so yeah, what your, your the periodic table looks well, something like this. Okay. The staircase is right here, something like that. Okay. So yes, the elements that are on that staircase, like to the right or left of it, they're called metalloids. And what's cool is they basically have properties of both metals and non-metals. That's just a bit of a non-conductive. Okay. So under the right conditions, they can act like a metal, and on the other right conditions, they can act like a non-metal, and that makes them pretty useful for certain applications. Um, I almost should have added that in here because I'm looking at this. I only did metals and non-metals. Probability um, be added in here. Yes. Yeah, because exactly, because under like if you run, um, I can't remember if you if the temperature is right, it'll act like. I think if it's cold temperatures, it acts like a non-metal, and under warm temperatures, it acts like a metal. And it can it can act like a switch. So electrically, they call them uh, transistors. I think I forgot the term right. Because um, uh, they can they can act like uh, they can act like a switch in a circuit. So they're pretty useful that way. Anyway, um, I was going to say metalloids and then staircases, <coughs> just as a reminder that they're kind of in between. 
Oh, what else do you know about metals, all the other stuff? Um, malleable, that's a fun uh, vocabulary word. It just means you can shape it into anything. Okay, you can pound metals into any shape. Ductile means you can make it into a wire. Okay? So, yes. They have what's called luster, which just means they're shiny. Okay? <laughs> shiny. And they conduct heat and electricity. The word conduct does refer to heat and electricity. So if you say it's a good conductor, it should conduct both of those. It should conduct electricity and it should conduct heat. And the reason for that, as it mentions, is you've got three flowing electrons. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll we'll draw a quick diagram that kind of emphasizes that in a second. Nonmetals are basically the opposite all across the board. Okay? They don't form positive ions, they form negative. Um, they aren't shapeable. Okay? It's not easy to shape them. They don't hold a shape. Um, they don't conduct heat or electricity. And the reason for that is because the electrons there, they hold the electrons really tightly and they won't let them flow. Metals will let their electrons flow all day long. In fact, here, I want to show you that just quickly. Underneath metals, um, we can do a brief diagram of aluminum, for example. So I'm just going to draw, and you can add this if you want, I'm going to draw just like three aluminum atoms. And I'm just going to represent them with their uh, element symbols. Okay, so I've got three aluminums. Aluminum wants to, if it can, it wants to get rid of three electrons so that it can be stable. And if it does that, if you get rid of three electrons, what would your charge be now? You were neutral to begin with, and I just ripped three electrons off of you. Now, what is your charge? Positive, positive what? Three. Positive three. See, so there you go. So that's what I'm saying. Like you mentioned, you're like, wait a minute, why did you become positive? Because you lost three electrons. So the point is, inside pure aluminum, the atoms are basically Al3+, because they just want to get rid of their electrons. And they do in a salt, in, like in pure aluminum, that's what happens. But the electrons, they just get released. And they're just kind of floating around everywhere, okay, around the aluminums, okay, or around the nuclei, the nucleus of these um, Aluminum atoms. Okay, so you can think of a solid aluminum is just obviously it's a you have to have the protons and the neutrons, but the electrons just kind of flow around it and or around the nuclei. And yeah, they're free to move. Like you can you can run electrical current through aluminum because it's a conductor. Extra electrons will just kind of jump in the pool, so to speak, and just swim through the the metal, and they'll come out the other side. I'm simplifying it a little bit, but that's electricity. Okay, that's like the movement of electrons. So, um, when it comes to bonding, those three things come into play. Okay, so this isn't going to surprise you. An atom is most stable when its outer energy level is full of electrons. Okay, so then there again is they're like noble gases. Okay, nature has a tendency to want to be stable. All systems want to go to, they call it equilibrium, that's another vocabulary word we'll get to a bit later, but um, all systems want to get to that point, and chemistry is no exception. Uh, atoms want to do this. So how do they do it? Yes, the one is you can lose electrons, you can gain electrons, or you can share. Lose, gain, or share. So we already viewed that in terms of um, what happens just with a single atom, but when it, we have multiple atoms, the same process is happening. So I already asked you guys that question, and you answered it pretty quick. If you lose electrons, that makes you positive. So just go slow when you're reading this, right? If I lost electrons, that means I have more protons than I have electrons now, and now I'm positive. So you lose something that lose electrons makes you positive. You gain electrons, you have extra negative charge. Now you are negative. We use these terms pretty lightly, but someone had to come up with them. <laughs> Oh, quick, a quick detour to the science wall. Can anybody recognize this man right here? Hey, cool. How do you know it's Benjamin Franklin? <laughs> His haircut. $100 yes. Yeah. The Americans honored him by putting him on a $100 bill. He's one of the signers of the, the U.S. Constitution, Declaration of Independence, I think. Um, brilliant scientist. He's the one that came up with the term positive and negative. He studied static electricity. He's the guy that was flying kites and thunderstorms. You guys might remember that story. Um, he didn't, but others did that tried that experiment, apparently. <laughs> 
Can you imagine? I mean, we what we know about electricity now, I'd be like, what are you doing? Like no one flies a kite in a thunderstorm because like that's a recipe for death. But um, yeah, uh, they didn't understand electricity too well. But Benjamin Franklin um, did experiments like that. Anyway, oh, and then there's the law of charges. I realized that there it was later in the notes. I forgot it was there. So yeah, like charges repel. So if they're positives, two positives um, will actually push each other apart. And then a positive and a negative, they will attract each other. That's not too surprising. So, uh, whoops. So when we're talking about bonding, um, the vocabulary is a compound. A compound is two or more elements that are with different atoms. They're joined in fixed ratios. Okay. Um, the well, the simplest one we're going to look at is salt. That's a great way to start when you're, when you're reminding yourself about how compounds work. Uh, you should know the difference between an ionic compound and a um, molecular compound. Why is molecular not in here? Oh, it's later. It's on the next page. Got it. So ionic, yes. A metal and a non-metal, yay. And that should make sense to you because we looked at the table. The metals are always positive. The non-metals are always negative. So they're going to want to hang out. Okay, They're going to want to get together, and they do all the time okay? in different proportions. So when they do get together, the bond that holds them together is called an ionic bond, okay? That's just attraction from positive and negative. So uh, the example here, it says draw the salt molecule, sodium chloride, show how it forms a crystal structure. This shouldn't surprise you too much. If you just draw, let's just keep it simple, the, uh, the sodium molecule would be Na plus, and the chlorine molecule would be Cl minus, okay? So um, if you are sorry, as an atom, okay? So these guys are going to form a bond between each other. We can just show just a bar or something connecting them, okay? So that's pretty easy. Um, but that's just one molecule of salt. Uh, if you grab salt, you know, from the kitchen, you definitely have more than one molecule of sodium chloride, okay? So um, what do you think, or sorry, this chlorine, because it's negative, it will attract other positive sodiums. And we can do this basically in, um, it basically does it in uh, four directions, okay? So if you're going to build a crystal, you need a structure. And so surrounding the chlorine, you would have sodiums, all like this, okay? And then those sodiums would be attracted to chlorines, which could also be attracted to sodium. So anyway, so you could build a grid, okay? And this is simplifying it a little bit, but not really. Um, you can build a grid out of sodiums and chlorides, and that is how you get a solid, okay? That's how you get the structure. So it, it forms what's called a crystal. You guys have heard of crystals. Um, salt, can, salt forms crystals. A lot of other um, compounds do. Not all compounds do this, but... Um, a crystal structure can easily form when you have positive and negatives and you've got this complex. I guess technically that would be in three dimensions. We're only doing it in two dimensions here, but in three dimensions, um, you could get um, attraction between all of the components. Okay? Brilliant. All right. So just a little bit more then on this. If you guys are good, I'm not going too fast. You guys are okay? Let's go to the next page. The other one you guys already remembered was the molecular compound. This is between two or more non-metals only, okay? So the major distinction here, there aren't any ions, okay? There's no ions to produce the bond. The bond happens from sharing electrons, okay? And we've already seen that up here, um, the covalent bond. That's the, that's the name of the bond for a molecular compound is a covalent bond. And uh, like I already mentioned, it's the attraction of the nucleus to the shared pair of electrons to create this bond. We're going to sketch some here in just a second, okay? So uh, we're not, we don't have ions. Yeah, we don't have positive or negative. We just have um, the simultaneous attraction to a shared pair. So uh, I guess that was the definition of a molecule right after. A part of bonds, a fixed number of covalently bonded non-metals, okay? So this is a bit of an introduction to organic chemistry. We're going to study that a little bit later. But uh, it says draw a carbon-hydrogen bond. 
Okay, so if carbon, if there was just a molecule of carbon all by itself, and there was a molecule, I should and say molecule, I should say atom. If there was an atom of carbon and an atom of hydrogen, and they were just floating around, how would they uh, bond covalently? How would their electrons come together? So let's look at carbon first. If you look at carbon, it has six protons, six neutrons, well, yeah. Well, it has six protons and six electrons. Um, how many mole how many electrons would be in the outer orbital of carbon? We'll try to make you think about that for a second. So carbon has six protons, so that means it has six electrons. So if you start distributing the electrons according to the pattern, what is it? Four. Four. Bingo. Okay. So your Lewis dot diagram, that's the easiest way to picture this. You have four positions, okay, and those electrons will be positioned just like that. If you do, what's the Lewis dot diagram for hydrogen? You guys remember H. that one? It's, well, it's H. How many electrons does it have? Just one. So you have H, and let's do this. Um, I guess I need to change color. It's really fun. So the hydrogen has one electron. Now, carbon wants to be stable like everybody else. And carbon has, I'm going to draw these as X's. Carbon has four empty spaces, four empty spaces on it where it could share an electron. So if a hydrogen shows up, it would like, it would like to fill at least one of those. Okay. So all we have to show here, I mean, I guess you can draw an arrow there, or really what we should do is draw a carbon with three electrons that are, are not paired up, but then there is a pairing with the one carbon or the one sorry, the one electron from the hydrogen. Okay. So I just box that just to make sense. That shows a covalent bond between carbon and hydrogen. But that's just one, uh, that's just one carbon and one hydrogen. The carbon isn't really happy yet though, because it still has three basically binding sites. Ooh, if we had lots of hydrogens, I, so I, I get where Becky's going here. If I had lots of hydrogens, what would happen to all of those binding sites? They would just fill in with hydrogens and then you get CH4, which is methane. That's the fuel we were talking about that, that, that SpaceX uses for their rocket. It's a very simple compound and it's really easy to make. So let's push you guys just a little bit because I think you could see very easily, we could just add three more hydrogens and you'd have CH4. What if I made a carbon chain of four carbons, okay? If I had four carbons and then I had as much hydrogen as I wanted, so I, I had all the hydrogen atoms I wanted, what would that molecule look like? So first off, I'm going to just, just leave some spaces in between here. I think you guys will see it right away. If we had four carbons, they actually link up to each other um, like so. So again, each one was going to have four. But the middle one, oh, you know, I can probably get a better job of showing that. The one in the middle is they, we share that one. Okay, or sorry, the, those, those two carbons can share their, um, they can share their electrons. I'm going to sort of change my, I realize you guys don't have different colors, but I need to get the picture easy enough. Um, so basically, in between the carbons, you can get what's called a single bond. Okay. So the, the sharing happens in between the carbons, okay? Because they're, they're, and they'll be attracted to each other and they'll actually stay together, okay? Well, until you break the bonds, but we'll talk about how that happens later. Basically, you just burn it, okay? And it'll, it'll break the bonds. Um, what's gonna happen to all of these electrons that are on the outside? What, what will they do if there's a whole bunch of hydrogens kicking around? They're just gonna bond all the hydrogens, okay? So look at that. It means, and this is like, I kind of want to emphasize this is actually what it looks like. Um, there's actually in a flat plane, well, it's technically not flat, but um, 
there are four binding sites. So I've switched colors here. I'm going to go to blue. And every other available binding site, you'll have a hydrogen. So off we go. We kind of have fun throwing all these dots in here. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten hydrogens. Okay? So if I have four carbons and I have ten hydrogens, they will literally form a shape. They'll form a molecule called butane. Okay? Some of these names you guys I'm sure you've heard of. Um, so You'll see this really quickly here, but the point is we often, well, sorry, when we're actually drawing these molecules, we don't do all the dots, but I'm trying to do it on purpose so you see why the atoms attract each other, because the electrons are doing, the, or the electrons are the reason why there's these bonds in the first place. Um, when we draw this in organic chemistry, we just, we just put lines. And um, I think you guys did a little bit of this in Science 10. It's just been so long since I've taught Science 10. I can't remember if you ever did this. Because um, the point is we can show this molecule just with straight lines that show bonds, OK? So it, I know that's a bit ugly, but that's what it looks like, OK? So literally, these are, these, are showing the, these are showing bonds between the carbons. The carbon has four binding sites. So it wants to bind in four places, and it'll do it every time. Uh, in a couple of other cool ways, which we'll get to later. But this is the simplest one, OK? Bang, we have a hydrocarbon. Um, this is a great fuel source. If you burn it, you can get a bunch of oxygen and carbon dioxide and heat. Um, so hydrocarbons are crazy useful for that. Awesome. OK, so uh, the summary then, this is the summary here. I included this table just as a summary. Uh, because we have the three ways that bonds can form. And uh, they are um, ionic. So an ionic compound is a metal and a nonmetal. We have uh, salt, sodium, and ACL. Oops. Uh, some properties, yes, high melting point, soluble in water. That means it dissolves in water. We're going to get to solutions right away. Um, I should add, it will conduct electricity in water. Oops, running out of space. Will conduct electricity, okay? But only in water, okay? Like if you just take, um, if you just take salt and like put two electrodes in it. Um, the current won't flow because it needs to be, they need to be ions. It has to be dissolved in water. But yeah, that's why you don't, um, <laughs> that's why you don't have your toaster by the tub and cook toast while you're having a bath or whatever. Because you know? <laughs> uh, you, any, any electrical source that hits uh, um, water will conduct electricity in an electric field. So yeah, things not to do to extend your life. Um, yeah, yeah, we're like, we're going to conduct an experiment. Okay, um, yeah, hard plastic, that's carbon and hydrogen. It's actually a petroleum product. That's molecular. We just looked at that one. Um, they're better, they're, they're flexible, um, but they don't dissolve in water. All plastics don't dissolve in water, and they don't conduct electricity. Either. Okay, so they're good insulators. I guess we could say that. Um, plastics are good insulators. And we're talking about um, properties of compounds. And then the last one is just metals. Okay, so if you have uh, either alloys or just pure metals, um, they are obviously. Um, oh, sorry, this is talking about the type of bond, the category of matter. So it's it's, it's just a metallic element or it's a metal, and yeah, they're they're shapeable. Um, you have to heat them up pretty hot in order to melt them, to turn them into liquids. Definitely, you can't dissolve them in water, but they're good conductors. Okay? So, I'm not saying you need to memorize all of these properties, but you should know them generally. And you can reference this when we hit assignments. Like, hey, wait, what were the properties of 
you know, uh, of metals uh, and what were the properties of uh, molecular compounds and ionic compounds. Okay. Awesome. All right. Let's just, actually, this next section, I think, is about as far as I want to go. And I want to show you guys, I want to add some stuff here because I want to show you a few examples of these. So that was forming bonds, what we just discussed, okay? And it's driven by added elements. Again, want to be stable. They want to be like the noble gases, and so they will do that. But if you want to break those bonds, there's a bunch of ways we can do that. And when you do, you typically create a new substance. So the, the first terminology, the, the first uh, term there is uh, chemical change, okay? The main thing to remember with this is this only happens if a new substance is produced, okay? If you, go, if you undergo a process and you don't get a new product or a new um, material, it wasn't a chemical change, it was a phase change, okay? So let's add this to the bottom. I meant to do this. You guys have seen these already. If you see, like, oh, what can we do here? Um, yeah, let's just say... Let's, let's use oxygen. So oxygen, oxygen can exist as a solid. <laughs> uh, to get solid oxygen, you have to get it insanely cold, like ridiculously cold. I don't, I don't even know what the number is, but it's really, really small, or really, really low. But you can also have O2 liquid, liquid oxygen. That's what is put in rocket engines, okay? Um, so when they load the propellant, they, they don't load oxygen as a gas. They load it as a liquid. It's very, very cold. And then, of course, you can have O2 gas. So there you go, SLNG. You guys have seen those already. You see them in brackets. They're signifying a phase, okay, like the state of matter that the material is in. So there's some really cool phase changes that can happen. And I broke them down, and I broke them down into the six phase changes that are possible. Because the point is you can go from solid to liquid, or you can skip the liquid phase and go from solid to gas. And then you can reverse all of them. So you could go from liquid to solid, or you can go from <coughs> gas to solid. You can skip the liquid phase. Or of course you can go from liquid to gas and gas to liquid. Okay, so there's all those possibles, right? You can you can you're the depending on the circumstances you can jump all around. Um, the oh wait, because I wanted to show you one. I stumbled across one that I did not know existed, and I thought it was pretty cool, so I'll show it to you. Anyway, um, yeah, we can put a few examples here. Solid to liquid. An easy one for me is ice to water. Okay, um, that's just melting. That that that's very common to us. Oh, but solid to gas, okay? Um, one of the coolest ones, actually, I've seen this. Have you guys ever put, um, you guys ever had a, a tray of ice in your freezer for a really long time? What happens to the ice? If you make a, make a tray of ice and you just leave it in the freezer for like weeks or even months and you come back to the tray of ice, what has changed? Well, it's frozen. It freezes right away. You now it freezes in whatever, like an hour or two. But maybe you haven't ever noticed this. If you leave a tray of ice in the freezer for a long, long time, guess what happens? The amount of ice in the tray shrinks. It starts to go down. Have you ever come to an ice tray to crack it? You're like, we tell these ice cubes are really small, but the tray is like, it's like missing some ice. Guess what happened to it? It, well, it, it, I mean, it, it's not shrinking. It's, it's changing. It, the, the process is called sublimation. It's changing from a solid directly to a gas. And it's happening in your freezer. Okay? So you don't, you don't open your freezer and see liquid in there because liquid won't, liquid won't exist. It'll, it'll turn to a solid. But over time, I think part of it is the, the convection that's also like the air movement that's inside your freezer. Um, it can trigger sublimation. So um, your, uh, your ice cubes can turn directly into gas, which means there's less ice. That always puzzled me sometimes, or it did puzzle me at first. I could, because I, I make ice and then you go, you go back later. Like when I make my ice trays, I have it full right to the top. So the ice is bleeding from little, from trough to trough, if you guys can imagine that. And the ice is like all over top of it. But you leave that in the freezer for a long time and then you go to get your ice cubes. 
the ice isn't from trough to trough anymore. It's like shrunk down into the troughs. Like, why is that happening? Sublimation, sublimation, okay? So, um, but anyway, oh, one of the really cool ones is um, dry ice. Yes. You guys know what dry ice is? Yeah, what is it? CO2 in what form? What do you think? Solid. There you go. Yes. So dry ice. Dry ice is really CO2 solid, okay? Solid CO2. And what's really cool is dry ice goes directly to gas. There's no, you don't see liquid carbon dioxide, okay? So when you're making like homemade root beer, which is a fun one to do, or if you get any packages that are shipped to you that are supposed to be kept cold, they're usually packaged in dry ice. Okay, if you ever work at a hospital or if you know someone that does, they often ship packages that have to stay cold in dry ice um, because when it evaporates, there's no liquid. And so it doesn't make the cardboard box that it's in go soggy. <laughs> you imagine shipping something with, with water, like ice water, like ice cubes made of water. If you ship that, it's just going to melt. And then you've got this like soggy box or whatever that shows up to your house, that doesn't happen with carbon dioxide. So it's a, it, it, we use it all the time to ship stuff to keep it cold, but it doesn't mess up the, the cardboard box. Like they don't have to ship it in a metal box, they can just ship it in a cardboard box. Because if, um, if, the, if the carbon dioxide, as it warms up, it just turns into gas, skips the liquid phase. So it's a really cool application, and there's one I'm gonna show you with that. Anyway, so yeah, dry ice is a good one. Liquid to gas, oh, that's just like boiling water. That one's easy. What did I say? Liquid to solid. That's just the reverse. So that's just water to ice. But gas to a liquid. Um, condensation. That one's fun. If you get a nice... Um, uh, oh, yeah. Uh, you guys know what a coaster is? What's a coaster? Okay. Why do, you, why, why do people put their drinks on a coaster. Why do you do that? So the table doesn't get ruined from the, that's it. Okay. The, the, the liquid in your glass, it's not bleeding through the glass. It's the temperature of the, the temperature of your glass is making the air outside it condense to go from gas to a liquid. And that, those are the beads that you see in all the commercials <laughs> or like any, uh, or, or no, if you go out to the vending machine and you look at the pictures of the pop cans, they're all covered in condensation because it makes it look cold. You're like, oh, that looks good. And then so you buy the pot. That's condensation. Yeah, that's like, that's that's the um, the conversion of the vapor into a gas, on, or sorry, the vapor into a liquid on the surface of the, you know, drink or whatever. Okay. So, oh, and gas to solid. We talked about that one. It's the other way around. Um, or making dry ice. Here, I should change that, not just dry ice, but it's making dry ice. So, um, oh yeah, I wanted to show you a video I found that, um, uh, I wasn't aware of this, but um, apparently, like, mechanics or people that do um, deep cleaning can use dry ice, um, basically a dry ice under pressure uh, and they blast it out kind of like almost like you're sandblasting but you use dry ice to do it and you can clean um, you can clean like basically vehicles or any anything that's got a buildup of you know rust or dirt or grime or anything um, so actually I'm just gonna find it quick oh this is gonna make me have to sign it I already have this here Okay, actually, I guess I can, let me just pause this for now. I'm, I'm recording. All right, so listen, you guys, hey, we got about 15 minutes here. Let's just finish this page. And, um, and then I'll maybe show you some water demonstrations. So, all right, um, two terms you guys have learned. Um, if heat exits a reaction, so when, when bonds are breaking or forming, either one, if you release heat, that's called exothermic. Okay. Whoops. That did not work. Exothermic. Okay. So where heat exits, um, 
The reverse of that is called endothermic. You should just know those terms generally. Okay, exo means it's le it leaves. Endo means it requires it. Okay. Um, where we're headed pretty soon here is making solutions uh, where we mix or dissolve a compound in typically water. Um, but it doesn't have to be water. So you need to know the difference between what's known as a solute and a solvent. Okay. The solute is the substance that dissolves, so that's what disappears, like the salt, you put that, or you put sugar, that's called the solute. The solvent is the <coughs> substance that causes the dissolving, so it's typically water, okay? Um, we'll, I'll try and refer to those regularly, but um, this picture captures it. If you see that here, the, the, uh, the solvent is the blue dots. Yours aren't blue, but it's like, it's just whatever the material's in, and there's, there's salt as a typical uh, solute, okay? Plus and minus. But though these are all the bonds that are holding them together. The water will actually it break those bonds and then it dissolves, okay? Then it, uh, you can't, well, in lots of times you can't even see the solute anymore because it's uh, disappeared. So why does water do this? This is what I want to end on today. Water, uh, if you see on the next page, there's just a bunch of pictures of it. But water is such a great solvent because it is a polar molecule. It has poles. Basically, it has regions. So it has a positive end and a negative end. And it's just because of the shape of the molecule. So these, all of these pictures show why water does what it does. And I can do a quick demonstration here that, that sort of confirms that. You guys maybe have tried this before. But if you have a positively charged object and you have it near water, the, the oxygen part, or sorry, the portion of water that's the oxygen, it is slightly negative. This little symbol right here is called delta. It's the Greek, it's actually this, you can see it right here. It's the small letter, uh, Greek letter delta, not the capital one. The capital one is a, is a triangle. The, um, the lowercase one is, I don't even know how to describe it. It looks kind of like an eight that's missing part of it or something. It's a funky symbol. This just means that this part of the molecule is slightly negative, And then where the hydrogens are, that's where it's slightly positive. So water, because it's, because it's polar, it can kind of get in places because it's attracted or repelled um, by those regions. So in the picture here, I kind of showed both of these like, here, if this was negative, then the positive side would be attracted, okay? Um, but if you take salt, which is what this could represent, okay? Uh, a crystal, everything's all bound together. The water, the water can just get in there, okay? So see the, uh, see the, the, the negative part of the oxygen on the, mole on the water molecule will be attracted to the positive, that's the sodium. And then the negative would be the chlorine and the water can, the, the hydrogen part of water would be attracted to that. So um, what we probably should say, see, look, this says the cation. If you really want to, you can say this is the sodium. Okay. So sodium gets surrounded by water and the chlorine gets surrounded by water for the, for the opposite reason. Okay. And that's literally what's going on when you dissolve something. Okay. Especially if it's a, uh, if it's an ionic um, compound, oh, but you know what? That partially explains why some particles don't dissolve in water. Because if they don't have a definitive positive or negative end, then water won't really kind of get in there and make it break up. So some stuff doesn't dissolve, it just doesn't work. So um, the, if they do break up, we call that process dissociation. I try to bold that down there. That's a term you could just highlight. Okay. Um, and if the if the these charged particles are free to move, um, we can measure, or they, they will move towards what what are called the electrodes of a conductivity meter. Okay. And I don't have one. I'm going to try and work on getting one. Um, if you have if you have a conductivity meter, it measures how conductive or how easily. Um, electricity can flow. So, um, oh, yes. The, so, yeah, the solutes that will conduct electricity, those are called electrolytes. So, you guys have heard of electrolytes. That's what everyone talks about in um, 
uh, like Gatorade and stuff. They're basically dissolved salts, there's dissolved ions. They're, uh, a lot of them are pretty healthy for your body because that's what your body's losing. Um, you guys know the story about Gatorade, by the way? Anybody know how it was invented? Well, Gatorade came first. Um, there was a, a, I think it was a chemistry teacher in a Florida university. It was known as a Florida football team, and the name of their team was the Gators, the Florida Gators. They were a football team. He analyzed, he was like, I wonder if I can come up with something that can help my football players. Give he, them all AIDS. No. <laughs> he analyzed, he analyzed their sweat. Because he's like, when they play football, they're sweating and they're losing liquid and something else. They must be losing something else besides just water. Because he's like, so he analyzed their sweat and their sweat was just full of electrolytes. There were salts. You guys, you guys, you guys get salt. If it, or sorry, if your sweat drips down into your on your face and if you lick it, it's yeah. salty. Okay, because your your body's literally excreting salts. So this this chemistry teacher was like, well, I'm going to make a drink that replaces those. So he, he analyzed the sweat. He analyzed the sweat, like the proportions, right? Because I mean, you're not going to just give someone a, like a stick of salt to lick. No one's going to do that in a basket, in a football game. Like, oh, thank you, because that's not refreshing. But anyway, he, he got the balances just right. And then he added some sugar just to kind of make it a nice drink. And he called it Gator Aid because it aided Whoa. the Gator, the, the football team known as the Gators. They were called the Florida Is that Gators. Really wild? Yes, yes. I'm not, even, I'm not kidding. It's a really cool story. And then anyway, it just exploded after a while. It seems like some major companies picked up on it, and now it's like Gator. I mean, I prefer but, to go to the ocean. Uh, yeah, but you know, but no, no one would do that either because you wouldn't just drink salt water because that actually, that actually pulls all it. Yeah, it'll kill you in the long run if you drink salt water and you need to, if you need to survive. It'll kill you because it'll. <laughs> so anyway. Okay. Oh yes. You know what? Let's. It went halfway down my throat. Here, yeah, let's let's just pause right there. Let's just pause right.